Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Well, this does go down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it, let's try another one. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. That does. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah, that works. So, how are you? It's good to see you today. It's, uh, gosh, we just have two weeks before Christmas, and, and this year Christmas is on a Sunday. Uh, so, that's always a, that's a wonderful, wonderful time to have Christmas if you're not a preacher. <laughs> Because the night before is what? <laughs> Christmas Eve, you know. So when I first started, we were doing two services. I would start one at, at 8 o'clock, and then we would have a midnight worship. And so I wouldn't get home till oh, I don't know, 2 o'clock in the morning or so, and then we had to wrap the gifts, right? And, and, but don't tell my children that part. They, they still think it's something else. Some, and then if it was Sunday, Christmas was on a Sunday, you were back doing two more services, you know, so... Uh, so it's great for y'all, <laughs> but for Christmas. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm troubled this morning uh, just because the, the subject that God has placed on my heart is really heavy today, okay? So can we just all take a, a breath on this? And um, it's heavy for me. It's uh, heavy for all of us, but it is part of the Christmas story. And what I've noticed that in Christmas stories, in the, in the scriptures, a lot of times we're easy to talk about we talk about the wise men, we talk about the shepherds, you know, we talk about, um, you know, Mary and Joseph and the, the cradle and all those things and, and the angels. We love to do sermons on the angels, but we don't like to talk about the slaughter of innocent children at Christmas. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about the slaughter of innocent children today. And I don't know how this is going to touch you. Um, there's, not, there's, not, there's no one here that has not been touched by the death of a child. It may not be your own child as a child, but it may be someone you knew, um, so a grandchild. I, we, we just finished at Kamak, and there were so many stories as people were coming out, because you really don't know uh, what everyone has been through. You have no idea what's gone on in their lives. Um, but we all know that we have been touched um, deeply um, by the, the death of a child. And so the Christmas story brings hope in the middle, in the middle of this. So uh, would you pray for me as I'm bringing the word to you um, that'll be what God would have me to say today. So, so if you'll take your papers, um, we're going to start, and you'll need these all through the sermon today. Um, and it's, this is week two. Uh, week one, we did Christmas is protection. Last week, we enjoyed listening to how Mary uh, was protected um, and we learned very much that there was a protection between her, right, <laughs> and the call, and what, how Satan can whisper to us, and that God is protecting us from the enemy, amen, here at Christmas. But now we're going to be talking about Christmas's protection for our children, for our children, for our children. Matthew 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Now we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Would you read that next verse with me? When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Let that set with you. Now when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophets have written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi, which are the wise men. He called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report it to me so that I too may go and worship him. Wow, absolute, absolute um, deception here. This man was completely, completely um, overcome by evil. 
So after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And Herod, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by another route. That's the, the wise men. Read verse 13 um, with me. And when they had gone, so this, this is going to get me. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Keep reading. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Verse 14, and I'll read the rest of this. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled the Lord, what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And so when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. Here it goes. Here's the Christmas story. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. I want you to think about a two-year-old. They're just adorable, aren't they? <laughs> they they're starting the, the, the talking, and they have their, they're developing their little personality, right? And they're just fun to be with, and they're also developing their, their temper tantrums, you know? <laughs> this is mine, 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 right? And they still suck their thumb, and that's, you love that, <laughs> you know? And, and they're just, and you can still dress them the way you want to dress them, right? You know, and do what you want, right? You know, with them, and you just protect them, right? You don't put a two-year-old out in the yard and say, have a good time, right? You know, you're just protecting. You're in mama mode, big time, daddy mode. Think about a two-year-old. 17, and then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. This is very important because this verse in Matthew 2 is the same verse that's in Jeremiah 31. And so Jeremiah 31, the verse, is being prophesied, and now the prophecy is fulfilled. The prophecy is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 2, which was prophesied in Jeremiah 31. And we know that. We see all through the Old Testament prophecies, right? Prophecies that Jesus will be born. Prophecies that he would be born of a virgin. Right? Prophecies of his death. I mean, even to the place of what his beard looked like, we talk about, uh, when he's on the cross. And so there's prophecies about Jesus Christ that are fulfilled, right, in the New Testament. This is one of them. This is one of them. And here's the prophecy. A voice is heard in Ramah, say Ramah, Ramah, weeping with great mourning because Rachel is weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. They are no more. Okay, we're going to stop right there. They're going to stop right there. So this is beyond a disturbing story, isn't it? I mean, you don't hear too many pastors are going to preach about the slaughter of innocent children during an Advent Christmas series. I mean, we still have the Christmas tree. I mean, look how beautiful this place is decorated. It's just so, I, 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 I told Robin, I said, honey, y'all you, 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 get hands down for studio. Can I just say that? <laughs> Lights and, I mean, hands down, I don't, no church. I don't care how big they are, how much they have. I mean, this is absolute. Look at this little snow thing going on over here. I mean, it's just a beautiful. And the Christmas tree and the decorations are still hung. I mean, in our house, I love cinnamon. And so I put, I, I put a candle that's cinnamon and one that's pine. And you mix cinnamon and pine together, and it is Christmas. Okay, it's just this Christmas smelling. And don't forget, you got eggnog in the refrigerator. Has anyone tried to buy eggnog these days? Oh my goodness, eggnog was $7 and something at Walmart of the day. $7 and something, whoa. It's Christmas, right? It's Christmas. And uh, the story of killing of the innocent is just not something I wanna hear, but we need to hear today because someone needs to hear it. I think that someone is me. So no matter where you stand in this world, no matter where you are politically in this world, no matter what you think in this world, in this world and in the worlds before us and the world to come before, you know, the absolute complete second coming of Jesus Christ during the rapture, all these horrible things that are happening. Children are the ones who are the innocent victims of it all. Children are. 
Whether they're in abusive homes, sexually abused, whether they're in alcoholic homes with their abuse, whether they're in, whether they're in children homes where they are ignored, whether they're in homes where they are beaten, whether they are in homes all over that where they're not fed, children are the victims. Every victim that I want to say, the innocent victims at the border, the crisis at the border, are the children. Flat out are the children. And every innocent victim of the drone strikes in the Ukraine or who? It's the children. It's always the children. It's always the children. And when it seems, when it seems that those in power, like the Herods of the world, when they start to feel threatened, why is it, Ray, that the first targets are children? Why? Why is it our children are the first target? When the powerful person feels like they're losing power, then we can attack with the children. At your, on your papers, if you look at the top right here on the top, that is a, a painting that was done by a French artist in 1824. It's at the top of the, on the right, and you'll see it. It's a mother, and she's, she's covering the, the mouth of her child. This painting is called The Innocence, and it reflects this passage of scripture. Because what we think about, when we think about Mary and Joseph and the baby, uh, especially Jesus at two years old when this event would have happened, we think about the picture of, you know, how Mary and Joseph are with him and, you know, just loving on him. And I saw this picture of the day right beside that. It's Joseph and, and Jesus. And Jesus is playing with his daddy there, you know, in the picture. We don't like to see this picture the one that the mother is stifling her child from crying so that when the soldiers come to get her baby, she's trying to hide and she's trying to stifle it, to be quiet. Don't, don't, don't be quiet, be quiet. Maybe they won't hear. Maybe they won't hear you. And maybe, maybe I can protect you just a little bit. I want you to know that this mother in this picture, when her baby was born, she rejoiced just like Mary did when her son was born. This mother right here, she had nursed her child. She had nurtured her child just like Mary did. Do you hear me? Just like Mary. This mother, she had dreams for her children, hopes for her children's future, just like Mary. In all accounts, we know that Jesus was about under two, about two years old, when Herod flew into this rage. And while Mary... Mary was taking her little finger and putting it in his mouth, Jesus' mouth. I remember when my daughters were growing up and they had the toothache stuff, you know, going on. You put that stuff on your finger and they would, you know, you put it in their mouth and they would, you know, <laughs> and do that, you know. Mary was doing that with her baby, Jesus. But this woman, she was doing this with her child. I don't understand I don't understand, Lord. And why Bethlehem? Of all places. I mean, okay, blood was being spilt in Jerusalem all the time. We knew that. But in Bethlehem, this little insignificantly poor village called Bethlehem? Why are you going after the children in Bethlehem? The people in Bethlehem were like people in Daleville. They were just good old country folks, right? Amen? That's who we are. You know, I feel so comfortable here in Daleville. I feel comfortable in Kamat. I just grew up in the South. I just feel like we're just like hardworking, good people who love the Lord, love our country, and love our church, amen, and love our families. You know, it's just like we, we're just, just those kind of people. That's how it was in Bethlehem. It was just these people. They were just country folk. I mean, Bethlehem is not Chicago. I mean, you would hear that, you know. This isn't Chicago. This isn't Detroit, all right? This is Bethlehem. And by the time we get to the events in Matthew chapter 2, Herod had been in power for 30 years. 30 years. He had had 10 wives in 30 years. Someone say, God bless him. Lord, no wonder the guy's crazy. I mean, Having one of us is enough, amen, women? But having 10 of us? I mean, come on. You don't need 10 of us, I can tell you that. One's enough. Ask Glenn, one's enough, you know? 
These, these people were crazy. And he had all these sons by these women. And every one of the sons wanted to kill him. They wanted the power. They wanted to succeed him as king. Several of the sons had already tried to poison him. Already. Herod had changed his will five times. Five times. And now he's some old man. He thinks he's got all of this in the bag. I am the king of all kings, and nobody's going to come in on me, and I'm just going to wait it out. And then shows up Mo, Larry, and Curly, the wise men from the east. They come in. Mo, Larry, and Curly, here they come. And they say to the king, where is the king of the Jews to be born? And Herod goes into a rage. I mean, an absolute rage. What? There's only one king. I'm the king. What do you mean, king of the Jews? There is no king of the Jews. I am the king of the Jews. I am the king of everyone, everything. And look what happens in verse 3 in your papers. Verse 3. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and what? All of Jerusalem with him. This is sort of like when mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Okay? Same thing. So when Herod is disturbed, all of Jerusalem, all of Israel is disturbed. All of Bethlehem is disturbed. They, everyone is disturbed. When he's disturbed, everyone. Do you have anybody like that in your family? That when they're disturbed, everybody's disturbed. This is what Herod is. And everyone is disturbed because they are afraid. What's he going to do? I mean, this guy is crazy. And they know something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And something did happen. He is so disturbed that he calls for the killing of every innocent child, two years and under, of every single boy child, and they are to be killed. That's how disturbed. And the people are all disturbed. I want you to hear something, something that's bigger than this, something that's bigger, something that I scream, something that we all scream, because there's something more disturbing, something more disturbing than just this promise from Herod that he's going to kill all the children. There's something that takes a knife and puts it right in my heart. And it happens in verse 13. Will you look at it with me? And when they had gone, that's the, the uh, uh, wise men. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. And I want you to stay there until I tell you for what? Read it. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Why? Why? Lord, help me. Why are Mary and Joseph the only ones who get a warning. Why is Joseph the only one who gets a dream? My husband Glenn didn't get a dream. Why doesn't my husband get a dream? Why does Joseph get a dream? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if Glenn got a dream that we were supposed to get up and take our daughters to Egypt, and if we had a son, take our son to Egypt, let me tell you what we would do. What would you do? We're going to Egypt, honey. <laughs> We're going to Egypt. But my husband doesn't have a dream. Why is it that the only, the only parent in all of Bethlehem that gets a dream is Joseph? Why does my child not get a dream? Why does my husband not get a dream? Why am I not warned? Where's my protection? Can we scream it? Where's my protection? Why is my daughter dying? Why is my son stillborn? Why is my grandchild dying of leukemia? Why? Why are the children all over this country and this world being abused? Why? When you give Joseph a dream, I want to tell you, if I'd been a mother during that time, 
why don't I have a dream? What have I done that I didn't get a dream? And let me tell you something too. Even if I had gotten a dream, even if my husband had gotten a dream, do you know it takes a lot of money to move to Egypt? And I don't have any money. I am poor. I am living in Bethlehem with my two-year-old son and my 10-year-old daughter, right? And I don't have any money. And Mary and Joseph, right, they have gold, frankincense, and what? Myrrh. They have money. They have resources to go to Egypt. Even if I had a, Glenn, even if we had a dream, we couldn't go. We didn't have the money to go to Egypt. So God, why didn't you protect my child? And every playmate, every playmate of Jesus becomes collateral damage of the actions of King Herod. While you're in Egypt, every playmate, Jesus, that you played with is slaughtered. Every boy child is slaughtered. So what am I supposed to do? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. What am I supposed to do with this? I know what we'll do. How about this? Let's just ignore it. <laughs> Let's just close it up, okay? And pretend like it's not there. I can't do that. I can't do that. Why is this happening to me? I thought it was interesting. In Feb on February the 10th, 1959, in St. Louis, there was a massive storm that was brewing, and there was a, a two-bedroom three, three house and a two-story house that was on a place called Del Mar Drive. And in 1959, the Cold War was in full swing. St. Louis, Missouri had decided that they would no longer use their sirens for tornadoes. They would only use them for attacks from Russian ballistic missiles that were coming in. So no longer. And they decided there's no tornadoes in February, so people can just get the information on TV and the radio. They'll be fine. They'll be fine. History showed that a tornado came through in 1959, the third worst storm on record, killing over 21 people, and eight of those were children asleep in the house on Del Mar Street. 17 tornadoes hit on one night with no warning. They said if there had been a warning, the children may have been saved. But there's no warning. There's no warning. And that's how it feels. This stuff happens with no warning. How do I know? And all I know is after 35 years of ministry, there are no glib or trite answers, and they don't help those answers anyway. I have buried children that were stillborn. I had a, one lady who had a child. It was her third child. And she, I was called to the hospital. He was born. He lived a few hours. And I got to go in, and she asked me, would I baptize him? And I baptized that child, and he had already died in her arms. I have buried 11-year-olds. We buried together a 3-year-old, 21-year-olds, and everything in between. And all I know is that Christmas is the answer. What in the world are you talking about? All I know is that in this story, it brings me the comfort and the absolute hope that I have for every single child. And I want to share it with you. Because no matter where you are, I'm praying that it'll give you some hope today. And it happens in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. Will you look at me? You turn the page and you'll see it. Verse 17 and 18. Then this is what was said through the prophet Jeremiah. I've already talked to you about that. A voice is heard in Ramah, 
weeping with great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Remember what I told you. This verse in Jeremiah is a prophecy what? Of what's happening in the book of Matthew at the time when Jesus was two years old. So it's a prophecy that's happening. And there is a voice. It says a voice was heard in Ramah. Okay. Now we also see that that voice is talked about with Rachel. And that's a whole other story. And I encourage you to look that up about Rachel. But that's not the voice that I want to talk about today. That's not the voice that I want to talk about. Because that voice is the voice of Jesus Christ. If you'll notice here, the word Rama, say that with me, Rama. Rama is about five miles, and those of us, uh, Marsh has been to Jerusalem, those of us who've been to Jerusalem, it's about five miles, okay, outside of the city. And Jesus Christ was crucified on a hill, what? Far away, right? And so we theologians believe that Jesus Christ was crucified at Rama. So the voice that is crying out is the voice of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. That is the picture that the birth of Jesus Christ is what gives us the hope of salvation for every single child. That's the voice that's crying out in the middle of this absolute devastation that we have with our children. That's the voice. That's the voice. You've got to understand something. When this was written in the book of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah wrote this, they were being exiled to Babylon. And the exile in the Old Testament is the lowest point in all of Israel's history. So what they were concerned about in Jeremiah is that all of the children would be exiled from their homeland into a godless, godless, can I say it again, godless nation called what? Babylon. And they were weeping because the Messiah had not come. They were weeping. Because no longer would their children be taught the Torah. No longer would their children be taught about Passover. Now they were being captive. They were being kidnapped and taken into Babylon. Do you hear this? Can I say this today? People, listen to me carefully. There is something much worse than death for our children. Something much worse than death. Every single child, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, every single child, it teaches us in the word of God, is held in the arms of Jesus Christ. Every single child is an innocent child. Every single one. But there is something that we need to weep over that's much greater than death, and that is that our children in 2022 are being led off to Babylon. 1962, prayer is, is uh, removed from public school. And our children were led off to Babylon. In 1963, Bible classes were called indoctrinations, and they canceled them all because our children started being led to what? Babylon. You do know that Babylon is the city of doom. It's the place where the Antichrist will set up his kingdom. If you want to weep over something, weep over our children are being led off to Babylon. Since 1963, violent crimes have increased sixfold. Teenage suicide rate has tripled, and SAT scores have plummeted. In 1980, the Supreme Court ruled the Ten Commandments violated the First Amendment. The First Amendment. Our children are being led to Babylon, and in 2022, only 64 percent of Christians. 64% of people, I should say, call themselves Christians. And in 1972, 90%. Do you hear what's happening? Our children, this is a prophecy of a time to come when the mothers will weep once again. We are weeping. Precious ones, Babylon is a breath away. That's all it is, is a breath away. All it is. If you want to weep over something, you need to weep. That our children today, our grandchildren, are being taken captive to Babylon. But Vicki, 
when I stand at that casket, why didn't I get a dream? Why didn't I get a warning? If I had only known, I would have never let my child get on the bus that day. If I had only known, I would have never let my child go to Sandy Hook that day. Why didn't I get a, a warning not to take my child and let them go? Why? Columbine. If I had only known. I have, I want to say this, it's so powerful. Every Jewish mother knew that their children were safe in the arms of God. I want you to look at that verse, verse Matthew 10, 28. You see it. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Hear that? Don't be afraid of people who can kill the body. They can't touch your soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And that's Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has made a way for us. Amen. He made a way from us. Look at John chapter, chapter 10, verse 21, one of my favorite verses. And I gave them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hands. No one can snatch them out of my hands. Don't you see every child in Bethlehem that was murdered was protected? I've got to go there. I have to go there. They were protected. Maybe you're not protected on this earth, but honey, this earth is going to end. This is not what you were created for. You were only here for a little bit of time, just a little bit of time. Your eternal life will be for what? Eternity, right? For eternity. And no one can snatch that out. No one can snatch that out. I've been to so many funerals. I remember going to a funeral of a, a drug addict that I had, a precious young man, and just kept having relapses and relapses and relapses and relapses and relapses. And finally, this last one, they found him in a closet. He was absolutely just, he had put so much stuff in his body, and he, he had died. He was in his 20s. Precious young man, and his mama got up at the funeral and said, I thank God my son's no longer in pain because that young man knew Jesus Christ. Come on, someone say amen. I mean, that may not be your addiction. That was his, but honey, I got addictions. Anybody else? We all have addictions. But that young man knew Jesus. He knew Jesus. And she got up. I'll never forget it. She got up and said, my son is free. Sometimes the things that we happen in our lives, we can't see it now, but we see it later, don't we? How God has protected us. God protected every single one of those innocent children. Every single one of those innocent children. They were protected. Now I'm going to say something. You need to listen very carefully. Because this is where God set me free on this. The truth is, Marcia, listen to this one. Joseph's dream, because Joseph had a dream, right? Joseph's dream was a nightmare. Before they turned around in Egypt, they had to flee again. I want you to look. Look at verse 14 at the top of that page. So he got up after the dream, because Joseph had a dream, right? Glenn didn't have one, but Joseph has a dream. So he got up, and he took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where they stayed until the what? The death of Herod. Let me tell you something. Being on the run is not all it's made out to be. It reminded me, this when I was reading the story, it reminded me of Bonnie and Clyde. I've always been intrigued with Bonnie and Clyde. And there's a picture of Bonnie and Clyde right up here. <laughs> you can tell everybody, I went to church this morning and Reverend Vicki preached on Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, that, that, just tell them all that, yeah. You know. and it reminds me of Bonnie and Clyde. I've always thought they were interesting, you know, these people, you know. And this is a, a, a picture of them. It, their, their life sounded so romantic, didn't it? I mean, it sounded like a adventurous, you know, and just awesome and everything. But the truth of it is, there were sleepless nights. They were homeless most of the time. They slept in haylofts most of the time. Bonnie was sick with high fevers for most of her life. One day they were eating at the finest restaurants, and the next day they were eating out of trash cans. They were on the run for two years. They killed 14 lawmen. 
14 lawmen while they were on the run. And when they were finally caught, Marcia, in Louisiana, the coroner said this about them. Clyde had 17 bullet holes in his body. And if you've seen the movie, they're shooting up the, uh, the, the, the car, you know, when they're Bonnie and Clyde are in the car. Bonnie, her body was ravaged with 26 bullet holes. Well, that sounds, that really does sound glorious, doesn't it? That really sounds, on the run, it's not what it's cut out to be. And Mary and Joseph and Jesus were on the run because Joseph had a dream. And for the rest of their li- for the rest of their lives they were on a run. Did you forget that Mary endured 33 and a half years of mental, emotional, spiritual, physical suffering all because Joseph has a dream. While all of the children who were massacred were safe in Jesus' arms. Her son was never safe. Mary would watch her son, listen to me, Mary watched her son carry your sins. No child, that innocent children that were were dead in that slaughter carried your sins, Denny. Not one of them. But because Joseph has a dream that we all are jealous of because I don't get one, right? Joseph has a dream. His son carried your sins. Todd, your sins, Ray, my sins, Connie, your sins upon his shoulders while all, he's carrying the sins of the whole world while all of his little playmates are safe and secure with Jesus, with God in heaven. Are you sure you want a dream? Are you sure? Is that what you really want? Is a dream? The only consolation that we have is the cross. Is a voice that's crying in Rama, right? Come to me. Our children are alive and they are well and they are free. Would you look at verse 18 that says it all at the bottom, Matthew 18. See that you do not despise a little child, it says. For I tell you that in heaven, what? What does it say? Their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. Every single child in Bethlehem that day has a what? An angel. And every child in the Ukraine has an angel. And all of your children have an angel. And that angel is facing not them. What's the angel facing? The face of God, right? And they are protecting. Protecting for what? Protecting for what? What does it mean to be protected? Well, this is what it means. It means that when we grieve a child, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Our hope is in Jesus. That's what's at the bottom of this page. I close with this. At the bottom of this page, you'll see that it's a painting of Jesus. You see it in the little girl. I love that. She's just got her arms right around Jesus' neck. Do you see it? It's so beautiful. I love, love, love that picture. That was painted by a man by the name of David Bowman. He sat down with paint and brush after 20 children were murdered and six adults at Sandy Hook. He said this, people were looking for something that they could embody, something that they were feeling, something that could give them comfort. Where was my child? Why didn't my child get a dream? Where was my child when the gunmen came in? And he said, that's what God showed me. He painted that picture. That's where your child is. That's where your grandchild is. That's where your teenager is. That's where the children are that are being abused. That's where I was. That's where you were, angel. That's where we were. Every single one of us, where you were, Brian, that's where I was. You too, Marcia. That's where I was. Secure. This painting is named Secure. (laughs) Isn't it good? It's named Secure. 
one more story, just because I had to tell this. It just happened this week, so I had to tell it. So you'll see a little boy there at the bottom. This week in, this is the last one. This week in Philadelphia, the police revealed the identity of this five-year-old boy. Um, he was, this five-year-old boy, 65 years ago, this child was found wrapped up in a blanket inside a cardboard box in somewhere in the area of Philadelphia. The detectives at the time said this about the child. It was recorded. In his very short life, they didn't know his name, in his very short life, it was apparent that this child experienced horrors that no one, no human being, should ever be subjected to. 65 years ago, he was buried in a potter's field. That's a potter's field is for someone who doesn't know the identity of, of a person, so they just get buried. Potter fields, you've heard of them. And they put the tombstone, you see the tombstone, I've made a picture of it. Heavenly Father, read it with me, bless this unknown boy. That was his tombstone for 65 um, years, the grave marking there, I guess. Well, it's 2022, and DNA advances have been just unbelievable. I mean, you can find anything else, anything about your life and who you are and where you belong and who you belong to. I mean, anything now. The body was exhumed, and because of DNA today, his identity is now known. You'll love his name. I have it right there. His name is Joseph. What a great name for Christmas. <laughs> his name is Joseph Augustus. I think that's just crazy because Caesar Augustus, do you know? I mean, it's like, what? <laughs> it's Christmas, right? So Joseph Augustus Zarelli, that's that young little boy's name. And this week, he was reburied with a tombstone. <laughs> and it says, no longer America's unknown boy, Joseph Augustus Zarelli. I've got news for you, Philadelphia. Joseph Augustus Zarelli was never unknown. He was always known. This child was never alone. And he is alive in the arms of Jesus today. But his grandma didn't have a dream. Evidently, his dad didn't have a dream. Nobody had a warning. What am I supposed to do with that, Vicki? I don't know. All I know is that when I close my eyes, there is something bigger than this whole world. And the sin and the pain and the struggles we have with families, all I know is that Jesus is alive. And we're going home. And we're going to meet Joseph. And all I know is the things that I think that I want to happen, that I think are good, just because it's my will doesn't mean it's God's. And he has the perfect will. And I know one thing, I am always protected, always. No matter what happens, no matter what happens to me, my children, our church, the United Methodists, all that stuff, our families, I am always held in the arms of God. And all God's people said, amen.